So now let's look further into rates of change, into what we call the difference quotient, and what it represents and why we use it. So right now, we talked about how to calculate slope and how to interpret slope and looking at increasing, decreasing behaviors of the graph. Whenever we find slope, we're really finding a linear rate of change or the slope or the steepness of a linear graph. So whenever we find an average rate of change, this assumes the graph is linear. However, we are able to generalize finding slope for all types of graphs, for all types of functions. It's not perfect, but we can sort of make estimates on it. So for example, if we have the slope between these two specific points, negative three, negative two, and six, negative seven. So if we look negative three, negative two, and then six and negative seven. So we have these two points plotted out. So when we find the slope of the line, without even drawing the line, the slope between these two points, let's see what we're really doing. So we have m is equal to, let's label this, we already have x1, y1, x2, y2. So negative seven minus y1, which is negative two, divided by six minus negative three. So remember when we're doing subtraction on a negative number, that becomes addition. So we're really doing plus, 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 plus. So now let's write out what this is. So we have m is equal to negative five over six plus three is nine. So this right here is the slope, negative five over nine. But what does that actually mean? Well, negative five is the change in the y values. So if we look at the change in the y values, that means from the first point, from negative three, negative two, let's label these points. So from the first point, we go down by five to get the same height. So it, it is a lowering by five. So we go down five and we go to the right because it's positive nine. We go to the right by nine. And so this is describing this linear change because it's only describing just straight down and straight right. So if we were to draw a line between this, that's what it's measuring here. It's kind of creating a triangle out of it. We could also go right nine this way and down five this way. Both work, um, it's the rise over run kind of thing. So that's what slope is really measuring. It's how much are you going down and how much are you going to the right. But that's all assuming a linear change. But if we have two points here that are say x1, y1, x2, y2. This line here isn't linear. It is a, always changing. So if you find the slope between these two points, it might be different than the slope of some other two points that are along the same curve. But this function, this graph is always changing. So the slope here, the best we can just say is it's y2 minus y one over x2 minus x1. There's no way, way really of knowing exactly what the slope is of this function. However, we can make some sort of estimates on it. And this is getting a little bit into some other types of math that we won't get into in this class, but we'll kind of dip our toes in. And it's called the difference quotient. So what the difference quotient is really doing is it is like finding a slope, you have two points here, two outputs, right? F of stuff, that's saying that's an output. So you have F of this stuff, X plus H, minus F of this stuff. So this is like the Y2 minus Y1 kind of thing. So you're subtracting two outputs. And then the H here is really the difference between two input values or two X values, X2 and X1. The idea is that the difference between the x values gets really small, so then the h gets really small, it gets close to zero. 
We won't get too much into the specifics of it, but we will use this difference quotient to help us with evaluating and to maybe just talk about how this relates to slope. So the most important thing to keep in mind when evaluating f of x plus h is that x plus h is the input. Whenever you see f of stuff, you replace the x values in the function with the stuff. So here, let's break it up into steps. We first want to find f of x plus h. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in x plus h into the function. So we have f of stuff, f of x plus h is equal to, now let's just write out the function but let's replace the x values with blank spots. And I suggest doing this, it might seem tedious, but it is very helpful for knowing what to plug in and how to evaluate. So we have x we're replacing with the stuff squared minus three times x, but we're just gonna leave it as blank space stuff. So this is the function where we don't know what that input is yet, but we look over here, we're replacing the x with the expression x plus h. So put in x plus h in for x. And then now we just want to expand everything out and then combine like terms. Now one very common mistake I see people make is if we're trying to evaluate say x plus h squared, you may have thought to do this x squared plus h squared. This is not what we do. What we really do is we are taking x plus h and we're squaring it. That means we're taking x plus h and multiplying it by itself. That's what it means to square something. If you do four squared, you do four times itself, four times four. So we're doing x plus h times the entire quantity x plus h. So we're doing x plus h times x plus h. Now there's an acronym people like to use um, for multiplying two binomials like this together. People say FOIL. I think FOIL can mess people up because once you get out of this very specific example or this very specific situation, then people don't know how to multiply binomials or trinomials like this. All it really is is just distributing multiple times. So you distribute the x into the second expression. So you have x times x which is x squared, and then x times h, so plus xh, and then you just distribute the h into the ex second expression, so h times x, well that's really hx, but I'm gonna write it as xh to keep everything consistent, and it's multiplication, so it's commutative, it doesn't matter the order, and then we do h times h, that's plus h squared. So this, we just found, is actually x plus h squared. That's what we just found right here because we did x plus h times x plus h. So now let's fill that in. So we have this is equal to x squared plus x h. I'm gonna write it all out and then we can simplify after plus x h plus h squared. So that was just the expanding the x plus h squared part. That was just this part here. And then the next part, we distribute the negative three in, the negative comes along for the right, so that's negative three x minus three h. So that was just this part here. So we've expanded everything out, now let's combine like terms. If we look around at the like terms or at the different terms we have, we have an x squared term. There's no other x squared terms, so x squared stays the same. And then we have an xh term, there's another xh term, so there's two xh terms. And then we have an h squared term, there's no other ones, so we just leave that as is. And then we have an x term and an h term, there's no other x's or h's, so those just stay the same. We can't combine the xh with the 3x because the xh has the h along with it. The variables have to match up for them to be like terms. So at the end of the day, f of x plus h is this.
So the key thing is to just plug in x plus h whenever we see the x in the function. Now the second part is to do the subtraction here. So in the quotient here, we have f of x plus h. We just found what that was. And we're subtracting f of x, the original function. So what we have or what we're looking for is to find f of x plus h minus f of x. So let's work that out. This is equal to, I'm going to write off to the side just so, so we don't have to write it again. f of x plus h, we just found what that was. I'm going to put it in parentheses so we can keep it separate. x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h. That's a mouthful. And we're subtracting f of x to that. And now we have to make sure we're subtracting all of f of x. So we need to put f of x in parentheses. Because if we don't, then the subtraction will only go to one term and not all of them. The subtraction has to go to all the terms because we're subtracting the entire function, not just part of the function. So you can think of this as you know we distribute the negative here. So I'm just going to write negative x squared plus 3x. That's really what we have here. And we're just combining like terms now. To save time, I didn't want to rewrite all of it. So let's see how we can combine like terms. We can't combine anything on the inside here. We already did that in the last step. Now let's look at the x squared here. So we have negative x squared here. Well, then we have an x squared here. So those add to 0. x squared minus x squared is 0. And then we have a positive 3x here. And we have a negative 3x here. So positive 3x minus 3x, those add to 0. So we're just left with 2xh plus h squared minus 3h. So that is what we get when we do the subtraction in the numerator. So this is the numerator of this difference quotient, f of x plus h minus f of x. And then lastly, we divide everything by h. So to actually get the quotient, or to remind us what the quotient is, we have f of x plus h minus f of x, all divided by h. So the f of x plus h minus f of x is what we just got right here. That's what we got. So let's replace that in the numerator, 2xh plus h squared minus 3h all over h. Now this is a good opportunity, this problem is a good opportunity for just pointing out a lot of pitfalls that people come into when doing algebra. And they're very common and they happen and we just get to learn from them. So this one here, what a lot of people want to do is just see, oh, I have an h in the denominator and an h in the numerator, so I can just cancel those out and then leave everything. But this h is dividing everything in the numerator. It's not just dividing one thing. So if we take it out from one term, we have to take it out from all the terms. So one good habit to have is to factor out anything that we want to divide out, just so that we make sure that we take it out of everything. So in the numerator, let's factor out the h, because they all have an h in common. So we have h times 2x plus h, because we're taking an h out, we're factoring it out. So we take an h out of the first term, you're just left with 2x. You divide an h out of the second term, you're just left with h. And then take the h out of the last term, you're just left with 3, all divided by h. And now we have h times all this stuff as a factor, divided by h. So now those divide to 1, and we're just left with 2x plus h minus 3. Whoo! That was a long problem and there's a lot of talking. But the main thing is to just break it up piece by piece. And that's a problem solving process. And that's what math is about, is working through some of these larger problems and developing problem solving skills. If you have a big problem that you need to handle, whether it's in work or life, you look at the big problem and see are there any smaller parts that I can solve or that I can break this problem up and then just solve the smaller parts and then before you know it, you will have the entire problem solved. 
For now, we won't really talk about how to use the difference quotient determining slopes, but it is good to think about would the slopes that, where are the slopes positive or negative on these different parts? Here, it's a negative slope. And over here, it's a positive slope. And so we have a decreasing and increasing part and we can evaluate and look at those different parts of the graph. Now we can start talking about symmetry and symmetry within functions. So what symmetry means just in general is that there's some sort of matching going on or some mirroring that you can see in the picture or in the function itself. So let's look at the different types of symmetry that we can see. On part A here, we have this function graphed out. This is the function in equation form, graph form, and table form. And we can see symmetry actually in all of the parts. But let's take a look at what symmetries we see either in the graph or in the table. If we look at this graph, this function does mirror itself. It mirrors itself over the y-axis. If you were to fold or put a mirror up right in between along the y-axis, the graph does the same thing. It mirrors on both sides. So you can think of symmetry as sort of like this mirror idea or this matching or reflecting idea. Now how does that look in the table? Well, on the table, if you look at this closely, we have these inputs, remember they're independent, so we just list out the inputs from negative three to three. We just plug those inputs in and we get some outputs out. The outputs are the part that we're interested in. So if we look at the outputs here, you have negative two is the output of zero, and then on either side of negative two is negative 1.5. So we have this repeated output. If we plug in negative one, we get negative 1.5. If we plug in one, we get negative 1.5. So we get the same thing when we plug in one versus when we plug in negative one. And similarly, if we plug in two, we get zero. If we plug in negative two, we also get zero. So for those positive and negatives, those plus minus inputs, we get the same exact output. So there's that symmetry within the table itself too. So let's write this down. In the graph, there is a reflection across y-axis. And the symmetry in the table, I guess there's different ways we could say that, but there's sort of like a mirror of the y values. And so we can kind of generalize this and say that what's really happening is that when we have a positive input, the output you get for that positive input is the same exact output you get for the negative input. For example, one and negative one have the same output. Two and negative two have the same output. Three and negative three have the same output. So those positive negative inputs have the same exact outputs. So that's a reflection that, that's really happening in both the table and the graph. You can see that numerically, you can see that graphically. Uh, so let's say to generalize it, same output for, I'm gonna write positive negative inputs. We call this y-axis symmetry. So now for the second part, part B here, we have this function negative two times x cubed plus x. So for the symmetry here, this might be a symmetry that you, you see it, but it might be hard to describe. There is some sort of mirroring or this nice symmetry that we see happening here. It's not quite a diagonal symmetry. It's not quite a reflection across the y-axis. It's a little bit more than that. And there's a couple ways of thinking about it. What actually happens is you do a reflection across the y-axis, and then you do a reflection across the x-axis. So you sort of do two reflections, and the graph should end up where it started. However, that's kind of hard to see in the graph. Right? It's hard to imagine doing this double reflections. Another way of seeing the reflection in the graph 
is to rotate the graph 180 degrees. So essentially put it upside down. So if you look and turn your head or turn the paper upside down, the graph should look the exact same. So let's write that down. It's the same if rotated 180 degrees. We could also say or vertical reflection and horizontal reflection. Now in the table, I think it's a little bit easier to see the, the symmetries here in the table. It's kind of similar to what's happening in the first part with the y-axis symmetry, where if we look at the outputs, we have some outputs that are almost repeated. Let's see what the difference is. The difference is that if we plug in, say, 1, we get negative 1. If we plug in negative 1, we get positive 1. Okay, so there's a little bit of symmetry there. Let's look at the next option. If you plug in negative 2, we get 14. If we plug in positive 2, we get negative 14. For 3 is the input, negative 51 is the output. For negative 3 is the input, 51 is the output. So you might be able to make this connection here and look and see, well, when we plug in these opposite inputs, we get opposite outputs. Where on the first one, we plugged in opposite inputs and we got the same output. On this symmetry, when we plug in opposite inputs, opposite outputs happen. So in the table, we can say it's, it's kind of like a mirror, but it's like a negative mirror. Whatever you look and see on one side, the negative thing comes out on the other side of the mirror of the y values. So we can generalize this kind of in a similar way that we generalized the first part. Instead of saying it's the same outputs for the you know, plus and minus or the opposite inputs, it's actually opposite outputs for, well, the opposite inputs or the plus and minus inputs. We call this one origin symmetry. For the third one, the last one, we have this relation x equals y squared. And ask this question, how do you graph it? For these other ones, you can graph them nicely. And originally this was with the idea of graphing calculators in mind. In graphing calculators, it's easier to graph these first couple ones, but it's a little bit harder to graph that third one. But we can actually do this all in Desmos. So maybe this is a good opportunity to practice with the Desmos graphing calculator. So let's take a look at it. So the first function or the first graph was f of x is equal to 0.5 x squared minus 2. So I'm going to use the alphabet here, the ABC. So f parentheses x is equal to 0 0.5 x squared minus 2. Now, if you need to pause that or go back to it to see all those buttons I push, you can. A lot of them are over on the left-hand side here. We have the X and the Y and the squaring, or the, you can do an exponent button here too. And that's what this graph looks like. And for the other function, we have alphabet again, G, and we can use any letter really. It's just the name of the function. G of X, parentheses, is equal to negative 2X cubed. So to do the cubed part, we go to the button right here that is a to the power of b, and then it puts the cursor in the exponent. So we just hit three. And then to get out of the exponent, you can just hit the arrow key here or just hit the arrow key on your keyboard. And now we're back down on the base level. And then we add plus x. And so if we look, this is the function that we have here. It might be easier to see the functions on their own. So if you do want to display or not display a function, you can just hit the colored icon on the left here by their names and just choose what you want to display. So the question is, what about that last one? The x equals y squared. So x equals y squared. We can just type that in nicely and this is what it looks like. And maybe we can even look at it here. And another way 
of looking at these relations or these graphs is we can look at them as tables. So if you hit the settings icon there, for these ones you can hit table, this one you actually can't hit table, uh, but for these other ones you can turn it into a table and see some of the specific values of the function itself, which will be useful later on. But for now, let's just take a look at our function here, or our graph here. So we can see it looks really similar to this first one if we bring it back open. It looks really similar to that first one. It's kind of the same shape, but just turned on to its side. So if the first one has symmetry, the second one must have symmetry somewhere because we didn't change or stretch or do anything to the graph. We're really just looking at how is the symmetry, how is the graph related to itself. So this graph actually has x-axis symmetry, which means that if you put a mirror along the x-axis, there's a reflection between the two sides. So down here, it looks the exact same as up here on the top half. So we would say there's a reflection across the x-axis. Now the symmetry in the table, so I wrote up the table here of some different points of this graph. So we have the point input of four, output of negative two. Input of one, output of negative one. Input of zero, output of zero. Input of one, output of positive one. Input of four, output of two. So you might take a, a look at this and see that it does feel like there's some sort of reflection going on here. It almost feels like it's similar to the first one where you have a lot of the re repeated values. But what's repeated here are the inputs. So it's the outputs which are varying, right? We're going from negative two to negative one to zero to one to two. And then the inputs are the values that are mirroring themselves. So the mirror, the reflection is happening over with the inputs rather than with the outputs. So let's say there's a, a mirror of x values. So to generalize this, we can say we have the same input. So the inputs are repeated whenever we have these negative or opposite outputs. For positive one and negative one, you get the same input. For the output of negative two and positive two, you get the same input. So we have the same input for opposite outputs. And so if this first one was called y-axis symmetry, then this last one is called x-axis symmetry. So to summarize all that and to define it even more, is we have two, well, three types of symmetries. We focus on two of them because one of them is actually not a function. So if we look at these different options here, might think and ask yourself which one of these is not a function. If your guess of which one was not a function was the third one, you thought maybe this one's not a function because we have some inputs that have repeated outputs, right? For one, it has two different outputs up here and down here of one and negative one. So because that this fails the vertical line test, hits multiple points, so this is not a function. So it's worth mentioning to see all the different possible symmetries, but this one we won't spend too much time on because it's not a function and this class is mostly about functions. So an even function has y-axis symmetry. And to write that out in terms of an equation, it's kind of what we saw in the tables or in the generalization. If you plug in a negative x value, you get out the same thing as if you plugged in the positive x value. So if you plug in some positive number, x, you get out the same exact thing as if you plugged in the negative number, x. So if you plug in one, you get the same thing as if you plugged in negative one. For an odd function, this has origin symmetry. Which means that if you plug in a negative number, you get the negative output of if you plugged in the positive number. So this is saying that for opposite or positive negative inputs, you get opposite or positive negative outputs. 
And then we also have the x-axis symmetry. But with the x-axis symmetry, then we can't say that y is a function of x because it fails that vertical line test. So let's take a look at some of our parent functions and determine if they have symmetry and if they do, what kind of symmetry they have. Because not all functions, not all graphs have symmetries. So let's take a look at some of our parent functions. So for the first one, we have f of x equal to x. Remember this one is just that straight line function here. So the question is, does it have y-axis symmetry? Does it have origin symmetry? Does it have x-axis symmetry? It doesn't have y-axis symmetry because there's no mirror over the y-axis. There's no reflection going on there. So the next question is, is origin symmetry. I think the easiest way to think about it is to look at the compare opposite inputs. So if we have an input of two on this function, right, plug in two, the output is two. You don't really do anything to the point. So you have an input of two, output of two. If you plug in negative two, well then you get negative two out as well. So negative two. So for these opposite inputs, two and negative two, you get opposite outputs, two and negative two. So this one is odd, or it has origin symmetry. For the next one, we have f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. Remember this one looks like the v. And so if you look at this one, and the question is, is it y-axis symmetry or origin symmetry, or is it neither? And it's good to look at the inputs. If you take two, again, you get out two again. If you put in negative two, well then you will get negative two because absolute value function, but if you put in a negative number, you get out the positive output. So for positive and negative inputs, you get the same output. So this one is even. And then moving down the list, we got x squared, which is that U shape looking one. And this one is very similar to the first one we looked at. It does in fact uh, have that Y axis or even symmetry. And then the square root of X that looks like this guy. And it's only trapped. It's only appearing in this one quadrant up here in the corner. There's no sort of reflections. There's no possible outputs for the negative inputs. So this one is neither. So then for x cubed, let's sketch that one out. If you plug in the positive number here for the input, you're going to get some positive output here. And if you plug in the negative version of that input, you're going to get the same negative version of that output. All right, 2 cubed is 8. Put that in a calculator. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8. So you get those opposite outputs. So this one is odd. And then the cube root of x, it's kind of like the x cubed, but just on its side. And this one is also odd as well. If you plug in some positive numbers into the cube root function, you're going to get opposite values out as if you plugged in negative numbers. All right. 8 as an input, you cube root 8, the output is 2. Do negative 8 as the input and you get negative two as the output, so you get those opposite outputs. For one over x, remember that one looks like this, where it's sort of separated in these different quadrants or corners. And this one is also odd, because if you plug in, say, one, you get one over one, which is one. If you plug in negative one, you get one over negative one, which is negative one. So you get opposite outputs for those opposite inputs. And then for 1 over x squared, this one looks like this guy. And this one looks you know, really similar to the odd function. And this one looks really similar to the 1 over x function, but it's just doing that reflection across the y-axis. So you can see this reflection across the y-axis, so this one is an even function.